okay uh, hello students uh, today we are going to be doing the current affairs for 27th of february now some of the topics that we will be discussing today are the hunar hats uh, which are organized by the ministry of minority affairs and then we will discuss about united nations the six principal organs of the united nations and then lynchings in india which is a prominent topic we have already discussed about this multiple times but we shall discuss about it from a different perspective and about chandrashekhar azad the next topic is about uh, judiciary and how uh, we need to Uh, what is the appointment of judges and what is the removal of judges uh then uh, about the cheeta this is again a static topic uh this is a, a different scheme when it comes to pensions for defense personnel and the council of europe which is an organization which has been existing since the time of world war 2 in europe so the most important topics would be voting at the unsc and regarding the judiciary okay first topic hunar hats the reason why it is there in the news is because hunar hats there was a hunar hat that was recently organized in hyderabad now what are hunar hats these are more like exhibitions or these are more like grounds where people can come and showcase their talent in traditional skills recently the union ministry of minority affairs has set a target to provide employment opportunities to 750000 artisans and craftsmen through 75 hunar hats now hunar hat is nothing but an exhibition of handicrafts and traditional products made by artisans from the minority communities it is for people from the minority communities all these artisans and craftsmen who have exceptional talent they get to display their items and they also find jobs in these uh, melas these are organized by the ministry of minority affairs under the ustad scheme ustad scheme again what is the implementing uh, ministry for the ustad scheme ministry of minority affairs now ustad scheme is about if at all uh, there is a master craftsman his skill should not get wasted so ustad scheme allows that master craftsman and tradesman to impart his skills to other people skills in traditional arts and crafts and the ustad scheme aims to promote and preserve the rich heritage of the traditional arts and crafts of the minority communities this way not only is the uh, are the arts and crafts being spread to new people and it also helps in further jobs it also helps in further remuneration and money but also at the same time these particular arts are not being lost and they are being preserved significance of hunar hats they aim to provide market exposure and employment opportunities to artisans craftsmen and traditional culinary experts it envisages boosting the skill of craftsmen weavers artisans who are already engaged in traditional ancestral works hunar hat has proved to be an empowerment exchange for master artisans and craftsmen now it has proved to be immensely beneficial and encouraging for artisans and craftsmen as lakhs of people visit the hunar hat and purchase indigenous handmade products of artisans on a large scale okay now that is the reason why hunar hats are important because most of these people tradesmen and the craftsmen artisans they don't have sufficient Uh, marketing capabilities like big companies do nor do nor do they have uh, the ability to compete at discounted rates or provide a cheap logistical delivery of items hence these sort of hunar hats or exhibitions will ensure that they get sufficient exposure and they get sufficient number of people to purchase the goods that they are willing to sell now united nations security council okay this is the only body within the united nations that can officially 
impose sanctions. Now, along so the United Nations has six uh, key organs, of which the UNSC is one. The United Nations General Assembly is one. The United Nations Trusteeship Council is one. United Nations Secretariat is one. Economic and Social Council is one. And finally, the International Court of Justice at Hague. This is the only one that is at Hague, while all the others are in New York in USA. Please remember this key detail. Also, please know that the five permanent members. Okay, we will get to that slowly. Now, India along with China and UAE abstained from United Nations Security Council resolution sponsored by US and Albania. Albania is the first time entrant into the UNSC as a non-permanent member. Till now, it has never been there. India has been on the UN Security Council eight times. Currently, it is the eighth time. Now, this particular uh, resolution sought to condemn the Russian aggression. And uh, hence, India abstained from voting. It didn't vote. It didn't vote at all. Rather than giving a negative vote or voting for the resolution, it abstained from voting. Now, uh, okay. The resolution supported by 11 UNSC members was vetoed by Russia. Now, this concept of veto, we will come to it. However, the US promised to take the issue to the General Assembly. These sort of procedural issues can be taken to the General Assembly as well. But this is the first time such an issue is reaching the General Assembly in 40 years. Because it is a crisis of huge nature. Now, according to the Indian representative at UN, who is the Indian representative? Who is the Indian representative at UN? Mr. Tirumurthy. Okay. India is deeply disturbed by the recent turn of developments in Ukraine. We are also deeply concerned about the security of the Indian community, majorly students, majorly healthcare workers who are staying over there. Prime Minister Narendra Modi also spoke to Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky on phone on Saturday hours after the UN Security Council vote and the Prime Minister expressed his deep anguish on the loss of life and property in the conflict according to the PMO. Now, moving on. What is this UN Security Council? Like I told you, it is one of the six principal organs of the uh, United Nations and there exist... Uh, the other five which we just spoke of. The United Nations Security Council also recently got five new non-permanent members. Albania, first time. Brazil, it would be the 11th time. Gabon, Ghana and UAE. Even UAE has abstained from voting, like what we had seen over here. Next, the UN Security Council was established by the UN Charter in 1945. It is one of the six principal organs. Okay. Now, the primary responsibility is to maintain international peace and security. The council is headquartered at New York. The council has how many members? 15 members. Five are permanent members. And these five permanent members are also the veto holding members. And there exist 10 non-permanent members. India is currently a non-permanent member. Uh, these non-permanent members have two-year terms. Now, uh, uh, they are non-permanent members and uh, their uh, council, their uh, council term would be for two years. Okay, Every year, five new members are elected. The five permanent members are US, Russia, France, China and United Kingdom. 
India for the eighth time has entered into the UNSC as a non-permanent member and will stay on the council for two years. Each year the General Assembly elects five non-permanent members for a two-year term, this we discussed. The council's presidency is a capacity that rotates every month amongst the 15 members. Hence, by the time India's council membership gets over, it might get the presidency for two times. This uh, India was already the president in the month of December. Now, you also need to remember that out of these 10 non-permanent members, the ratio is split up like this. Always there will be three countries from Africa, two from Asia, two from Latin America, two from Western Europe and one from Eastern Europe. The Security Council has the primary responsibility within the UN of maintaining international peace and security. It is the only United Nations organ that has the power to make decisions that member states are obligated to implement. Okay. Now, voting powers at the UN Security Council. Very important because each member of the Security Council has only one vote. Decisions of the Security Council on matters are made by affirmative vote of nine members at least. This is at least. Okay. Including the concurring votes of the permanent members. Why? Because the permanent members have the veto power and they can always veto others' decisions. So all of them have to vote in favor of the resolution along with an affirmative vote of a total of nine members in order to pass the resolution. Next. A no vote from one of the five permanent members blocks the passage of the resolution. Any member of the United Nations which is not a member of the Security Council may participate without vote in the discussion of any question brought before the Security Council whenever that particular country considers the interests of that member are specially affected. Only when the interests of that particular country are affected, it can participate in the uh, decisions of the Security Council without the power to vote. Please remember that. Now, moving on. Lynching in India. Since we spoke about this earlier, what is lynching? Lynching is a, a phenomenon where people take law into their own hands. Their own hands. And it involves punishments for things that are considered wrong. The things that are considered wrong may or may not be legally wrong but they are considered wrong by that particular public and hence lynchings are done now india does not have a specific lynching law remember now recently a man was again lynched in samastipur in bihar mob lynching is a term used to describe the acts of targeted violence by a large group of people the violence is tantamount to offences against human body or property. It includes both, against both human body as well as against property. Okay, now, the Supreme Court has given certain observations in the Tehsin Poonawala versus Union of India case. This is the most important case when it comes to mob lynching. The Supreme Court condemned the recent incidents of lynching and mob violence against Dalits and minority community members as horrendous acts of Mobocracy. It asked the parliament to pass laws establishing lynching as a separate offence with punishment. Such a law should be effective enough to instill a sense of fear in the perpetrators of the crime. Now, the Supreme Court has given directions to the government in order to frame a law for lynching. Currently, lynching is uh, punished under IPC section 308 for murder. Okay. And so the Supreme Court has observed saying that this is not enough. And the other guidelines that the Supreme Court has given is that there is there shall be a separate offence for lynching and the trial courts must ordinarily award maximum sentence upon conviction of the accused person to set a stern example. State governments will have to designate a senior police officer who will prevent the issues of mob violence and lynching. And the state governments also need to identify the districts which are prone to lynching 
and hence over here there will be special care that will be taken in order to prevent lynchings and the center and the state government shall broadcast on radio and television regarding the consequences that is consequences under ipc for mob lynching now despite the state police if at all uh, there are you know news reports that the local that uh, incidents of mob violence have still happened the police station should immediately launch an fir and begin investigation instead of any delays also the state government shall start off a victim compensation scheme for any of the lynching victims if a police officer does not do his duty then he shall be booked for deliberate neg- negligence which means that he shall also be punished though he is not involved in the crime if at all he fails to file the fir say then he can be punished for deliberate negligence moving on chandrashekar azad now chandrashekar azad's death anniversary was celebrated recently now mr chandrashekar azad was born on july 23 1906 in madhya pradesh uh, now some of the important things of uh, chandrashekar azad's life were that he was a part of the non cooperation movement please remember the de- these details because they come in handy in the prelims and he was arrested during this non cooperation movement as a student on being presented before a magistrate he said the, that you know he was azad and that his residence is jail and hence he came to be known as chandrashekar azad okay after the non cooperation movement was called off this particular non cooperation movement was called off in 1920 now as a result of the non why was the non cooperation movement called off it was called off because of the chauri chaura incident where a mob of uh, citizens burned down a police station after that gandhi called off the movement and hence azad because he could not go back to his studies he joined the hindustan republican association known as h r a The Hindustan Republican Association was an organization which was started by Sachindranath Sanyal, Narendra Mohan Sen, Pratul Ganguly as an offshoot of offshoot of the Anushilan Samiti which existed in Bengal. What was the revolution what was the other revolutionary organization that existed in Bengal which is very popular Yugantar now members of the hindustan republican association were bhagat singh chandrashekhar azad sukhdev ram prasad bismil roshan singh ashfaqullah khan rajendra lahiri most of the fund collection was through robberies of the government property and hence this hra also did a robbery attempt on kakori train uh, the plan was executed by chandrashekhar azad ram prasad bismil ashfaqullah khan rajendra lahiri and manmat nath gupta for this later on they were caught and uh, you know people were hanged it is okay i'll give you 2 seconds to find who was hanged okay if uh, okay okay later on uh, i hope you found out who ha- who was hanged after this particular thing uh, it was ashwakulla khan who was hanged and ram prasad bismil was hanged okay next moving on mm. okay uh Uh, hra was later reorganized as the hindustan socialist republican army why because bhagat singh was influenced by socialist ideals he wanted to establish the united states of india where there won't be any sort of exploitation by man against another man it was established in feroz shah kotla by chandrashekhar azad ashfaqullah khan bhagat singh sukhdev thapar and jogesh chandra chatterji now hsra planned the shooting of J.P. Saunders, 
who was responsible for the killing of Lala Lajpat Rai when he was protesting against the Simon Commission. It was an all-member, all-white member commission and Lala Lajpat Rai was protesting against it and then Lati charge happened and he was killed in the particular process. Azad later on, he also tried to blow up the train of Lord Irwin. And thus, uh, uh, Azad was killed at a shootout in Azad Park in Allahabad after being surrounded by the police. Okay, moving on. Judiciary needs more judges. According to the Chief Justice of India, he said that there was a need to both increase the number of judges in the high courts and urgently fill the existing vacancies. Currently, as on August 1st, 2021, there exist more than 455 vacancies in the judiciary in high courts. Now, what is the qualification to be a high court judge? He should be a citizen of India. He should have held a judicial office in the Directory of India for at least 10 years. It cannot be lesser than this. It can be more than this. And he should have been an advocate of a high court in succession for 10 years. Either a judge or an advocate for 10 years. Now, the other thing, over here there is no condition for an eminent jurist to become a judge of the high court. Unlike in the case of Supreme Court. This doesn't happen. When it comes to salaries and allowances of the judges of the high court, the judges of the high court salaries is fixed by the parliament and their conditions of service are fixed by the parliament which cannot be varied to their disadvantage after they are appointed. Okay, Except during a financial emergency. This financial emergency is declared by the president. And during this, their, uh, their allowances and their salaries can be reduced. Uh, okay, canons, it's also known as canons of financial property. Um, okay, next. In 2018, currently, the Chief Justice salary was increased to 2.5 lakh rupees per month and that of an ordinary judge to 2.25 lakh rupees per month. The Chief Justice of India is known as the first amongst equals. He is the head of the Supreme Court and in his office lies vested the powers of the Supreme Court. He is only the first among equals and he is not a moon among stars. Which means that most of the judges of the high courts have or most of the judges of the Supreme Courts have you know, equal power, equal uh, abilities. It's only that, you know, because the High Court needs a representative, uh, these powers are vested in that particular one representative known as the Chief Justice of the High Court. Removal of High Court Judges. A judge of the High Court can only be removed from his office by an order of the President. Only the President can remove a judge. The President can issue the removal order only after address by the Parliament has been presented to him in the same session for such removal. Only if the address by, from the Parliament has been received in that session, can he remove the judge. If it is presented to him in the next session after uh, the Parliament uh, makes an appeal or the Parliament passes the resolution, then he cannot remove the judge. The address must be supported by special majority of each house of the parliament. Which, me, okay. which means that each house of the parliament must pass the particular resolution for removal of the high court judge. As a, It has to be more than half of the total members present in that particular house and it should not be lesser, lesser than two-thirds of the members present and voting within that house. Now, the grounds for removal are two. One is proved misbehavior and the other one is incapacity of the judges. Only under these two cases can the judges be 
removed. Thus, a judge of a high court can be removed in the same manner and on the same grounds as that of a supreme court, which is proved misbehavior and incapacity. The Judges' Inquiry Act of 1962 has given the procedure regarding the removal of the judge of a high court by the process of impeachment. It is governed by this particular act. While the constitution just says that it should be a special majority, it is a Judges' Inquiry Act which talks about the procedure for removal of the judge. Now, for that, a removal motion signed by 100 members in the case of Lok Sabha or 50 members in the case of Rajya Sabha is given to the speaker or chairperson. The speaker or chairperson may admit the motion or may reject it at that first stage itself. It can end over here. If the motion is accepted, then the speaker or chairman will constitute a three-member committee to investigate into the charges. Now, who are the members of this three-member committee? One is the chief justice of the Supreme Court or a judge of the Supreme Court, then chief justice of the High Court and then third one is the distinguished jurist. If the committee finds the judge to be guilty of misbehavior or incapacity, then the house can take up the motion. Otherwise, the house cannot take up the motion. It should be remembered. Now, if the motion is passed by each house of the parliament with a special majority and more than half of the members, it is sent to the second house. And if it is passed over there at the second house as well, then the president passes an order for removing the judge. It, remember again, the president can pass an order for the removal of the judge only if that uh, resolution has been presented to him in the same session in which it was uh, uh, same session in which the resolution was passed by the houses of the parliament. It is to be remembered that since independence till now, no high court judge has ever been removed. Also, when it comes to forget uh, removal. When it comes to even transferring of a judge, it is the president who has to do it after consulting the chief justice. Now, the chief justice does not act individually. Rather, he acts along with the uh, collegium. Okay. Next. Now, also please note the composition of uh, the Indian judicial system. At the top, we have the Supreme Court, High Courts, Metropolitan Courts and District and Session Courts. Metropolitan Courts are at the cities, while normally at the districts, this is followed. Okay, uh, Within the Metropolitan Courts, on the civil side, matters involving money and criminal sides, criminal is uh, matters involving crime. Okay, Now, you have the Sessions Judge, Sessions Court at the top, at the city level and then chief metropolitan court below below him and then metropolitan magistrate courts. On the civil side, you have city civil courts and courts of smaller causes. District and sessions court. Please remember that the criminal side, you have sessions court and then judicial magistrate of the first class, judicial magistrate of the second class below him. And then on the civil side, you have the district court, sub court, and then Munsef court at the lower most rung. Now, also, it is the constitution article 214, which says that there shall be a high court. And the parliament has the power to establish a high court for two or more states. Now, okay. And then, uh, okay. please read about more of the jurisdiction of the High Court. What they can, can't do. And also realize that the number of uh, vacancies in the High Court are more than 455, like what we spoke of. Next. Wait for the cheetah is to get longer. Currently, India, we don't have any cheetahs. 
the last existing cheetah was hunted and killed in the 19 near about uh, 1950 itself and hence in india it is extinct asiatic cheetah is extinct now uh, okay you can please uh, uh, read all of this if you want 1952 the animal was declared extinct in the country and india plans to import cheetah from namibia 260 crores is the cost of the project now moving on uh, cheetahs it could be many months before cheetahs from namibia make it to india also remember this one nice piece of uh, history that mughal emperor akbar reportedly had an army of about 1000 cheetahs okay now cheetah is an indicator of grasslands if the grassland is healthy or not can be indicated by the presence of cheetahs in it it is an it is a keystone species of grassland habitats it could be many months before cheetahs from namibia make it to india according to the latest news why because an expert team of wildlife officials from madhya pradesh and the indian forest department visited namibia for a site visit and they were satisfied however this mou which require which is required for transferring of cheetahs it is yet to be signed okay recently an action plan was launched at the ntca please know if this is a statutory body under the wildlife protection act of 1972 and it is headed by the minister for environment he is the chairman okay now this action plan says that 10 to 12 young cheetahs uh, which are ideal for reintroduction would be imported from namibia or south africa as a founder stock what is a founder stock it is the stock that we start off with it could increase to much more later on but this shall be the founder stock now the animals lineage and genetic history will be examined to ensure that they are not from inbred stock why if they are extremely inbred then they will have lesser resistance and that at the slightest outbreak of a disease then they shall perish okay and uh, uh hence they will be making up a suitable founding population they will ensure if they have varied genetics that is necessary for a founder stock that all of them have varying genetics and they have a widespread genetic uh, gen- gene pool rather than being excessively inbred then if at all there is one disease all of them will get wiped out that is the ne- reason why we need to have uh, you know different gene pool the proposed site for reintroduction is the kuno palpur national park where is this thing in madhya pradesh reintroduction of species means releasing it in an area where it is capable of surviving okay reintroductions of large carnivores have increasingly been recognized as a strategy to conserve threatened species and restore ecosystem functions also recently the supreme court had lifted its seven year long stay on a proposal to in- introduce african cheetahs from namibia into the indian habitat why the supreme court first wanted lions the indian lions which are found only in gir to be first saved because all of them are located centrally only in gir there might be chances that they will get affected because of any virus if you are reading the news uh, very frequently uh, you would also be knowing that there is a canine distemper virus which is affecting the lions of uh, gir uh now in order to prevent things like that from killing too many people hence uh, it is important to show that uh, to you know transport these lions to other places where they can survive parallelly however it is a very political topic because the state government of gujarat doesn't want to transfer these lions because they are a tourist revenue and also the central government is against the idea of transferring it because it's a political move now the court has allowed the reintroduction of foreign cheetahs into the kuno palpur sanctuary in madhya pradesh on an experimental basis and hence we are trying to do that
please read about the characteristics of the african cheeta and compare it to that of the asiatic cheeta also known as the iucn status of the african cheeta is vulnerable which means that there are many more african cheetas as compared to the asiatic cheeta which is critically endangered also uh, the asiatic cheeta is smaller and paler than the african cheeta it has more fur a smaller head and a longer neck and it usually has red eyes and they have a cat like appearance as compared to the african cheeta which is bigger in size and it is, it doesn't have any red eyes it has normal white eyes and uh, it is much bigger okay next sparsh the ministry of defense has signed an agreement with the common services center e governance services india limited under ministry of electronics and information technology csc is under the agreement was to expand the coverage of pension services under sparsh across the 4 lakh common services centers so sparsh is a scheme that is there for providing pension services to defense personnel now this csc uh, this tie up with the common services center will ensure that there will be last mile connectivity to pensioners especially those who live in remote areas of the country and those who don't have enough technical knowledge sparsh is an initiative of the ministry of defense it aims to provide comprehensive services to defense pensioners thus tying up with common services centers which are more than 4 lakh in number will help in last mile connectivity and providing services to people who don't have access it promotes the government's uh, vision of digital india and more government more governance and less government okay last topic for the day council of europe russia's membership in the council of europe has been suspended after its invasion of ukraine russia has launched a full blown attack on ukraine with russian forces entering into the obolon district which is less than 10 kilometers away from kyiv which is the capital of ukraine now this council of europe is an international organization which was founded after the world war 2 in order to uphold human rights democracy and rule of law and prevent war in the case of europe however this crisis between ukraine and russia is the biggest crisis in the post world war 2 scenario and goes against the idea of human rights democracy and rule of law council of europe was formed in 1949 as per the treaty of london and it has 46 member states uh, and it has a annual budget also uh, please uh, remember the headquarters are at strasbourg in france now this council of europe is different from european council european council is under the eu okay please know that the council of europe like what we discussed is different from the european council and it is also different from council of european union now this council of the european union decides the legislations that have to be introduced into the european union parliament while the european council is the body that directs the political direction of the european union okay now there is also another important body known as the european commission uh while this european council decides the political direction of the body what are the political uh, steps that the european union has to take okay thank you